So rather than give you just nine names to take home with you, I also wanted to explain you why and how I try to select companies. Because that can give you nine names, you can go home with them, and in three months or in six months they could be useless because things change so fast and so dramatically on the, uh, in the mining sector. But before we get started, you'll see nine names. Doesn't mean you need to run out and buy nine names that you hear today. Everyone in this room has a different perspective, has different expectations and has different risk perceptions. So some people hate mining in Africa, understandable. Some people do not want to invest in exploration companies and only want producers, totally understandable. So the nine names you will hear are just ideas, ideas to explore, ideas to have a look at. But before we start with everything, there's a quote I would like to read you. I would like to make sure that you absorb, not just for the next hour, but for the next, well, 30, 40 years of your investment life. A mine is a hole in the ground. The discoverer of it is a natural liar. The hole and the liar combine, issue shares and trap fools. That's a bold statement. But I can assure you that about 50% of the companies listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange have not, at least, they should, well, they don't have the, uh, the, uh, the best interests of the shareholders at mind. They're solely created to create jobs for the management, for some people around them. They issue shares, try to trap investors in the stock, and then just enrich themselves by drawing a salary and only doing the minimum possible expenses on the ground. So just to simplify things, because I could talk for several hours about all this, is that I split everything up in three necessary boxes that I would like to see ticked before I would consider an investment in a mining company. First box, management. We've heard today before that management is an integral part of, the, uh, of, of an investment thesis because it's you're ultimately trusting some other people to manage your money and to spend it wisely on the ground or on a mining project. So does management, have they had any success in the past? Are they credible? Uh, do they have any experience in the sector? Because in the past five, six, seven years, we've seen a lot of investment bankers suddenly becoming mining CEOs. That's a nice career switch, but it's not because you understand capital markets that you know how the mining sector works and how you need to run a mining company. And finally, you should try to avoid family businesses. So family businesses are great in pretty much any sector because you uh, have families as anchor investors, that's fine. What I try to explain with that is that you sometimes see companies where the CEO is drawing a handsome salary, let's say $25,000 a month, it happens. And then you look at the annual information filings and then you see three pages later he has employed his wife for $150,000, for $200,000 a year. So, those are the kind of companies I try to avoid because you're never sure if they are looking after the shareholders and spending the money on the ground or if they are just trying to create jobs for themselves, for husband and wife. It does exist. There are five, six, seven companies I can name right now, but I won't do that. Secondly, project location, very important. So first of all, infrastructure is quite a big component of any capital expenditure of building a new mine. So if you can find something near existing infrastructure like uh, highways, electrical power, like the power grid. So that's fantastic. Additionally, you've got the legal framework that needs to be all right. If you go to Africa, the rewards could be high, but one day you own a project, you spend 10, 15, 20 million dollars on it to build it out into a mineable and viable resource, and then suddenly you get ousted and the next day the president's brother owns it. True story. Um, we also see a flight to safety, so the larger uh, companies are still looking to replenish the resources and reserves and they are looking at tier one destinations. So Canada, US, Australia, major companies are still willing to pay a serious premium for those assets compared to the riskier assets in, in second tier or third tier uh, mining jurisdictions. And thirdly, the third box I really like to see ticked is the access to capital. Because people seem to forget that exploration stage companies have no revenue. Their only source of funding is issuing new shares and trying to find buyers for those shares. So sometimes you have a company with the right management, which has geos and engineers to determine the viability of a project. You may have a project that's in an excellent location with existing infrastructure with certainty that you uh, do not lose the, uh, the rights or tenure of the, uh, of the land package. But if you do not have someone who's access to capital markets, or at least understands capital markets, then you won't go anywhere. And the usual outcome is a death spiral. You just continue to issue more and more shares, a lower price, and then you just spiral it out of control, and in the end, everyone loses. 
So Brecht asked me to split it up in, well, to split the nine companies up in three gold companies, three silver companies, and three miscellaneous companies. I did not obey Brecht. Um, there was too much value in the gold sector, so I just took four gold companies that I wanted to uh, walk you through. Again, these are just ideas. There is no immediate urgency to do anything with that, just ideas to plant in your head. First of all, is in a late stage exploration company called Gold Standard Ventures, which is uh, operating in Nevada. I'll uh, quickly shift through some slides because Brecht is going to mail them anyway and we are on a tight schedule. Um, so, management, first box. So, we have a combination of people who have been exploring in Nevada for several decades. So, that's a good thing because they know the country, they know uh, the state, they know how everything works down there. You also have a few engineers that they can rely on. So, from a technical perspective, everything seems to be okay. Uh, there's also, uh, well, I'll discuss this later, but they also do have uh, an excellent access to the, uh, to the capital markets because they have some people who are really familiar with raising money for uh, mining companies. Second box, project location. Well, Nevada is probably as safe as it gets. It's uh, known as a silver state, but it has a historical gold production of in excess of, uh, well, it says almost, but it should be in excess of 100 million ounces of gold because not every single ounce that has been produced has been officially documented, obviously. Another advantage is the access to human capital. Well, I was in Nevada just last month, and pretty much every single town lives and breathes mining. So whenever you walk into a local bar, you'll find miners, you'll find geologists, and there's no opposition against permitting a new mining project. So it's a good, well, a good place to be in. So um, yeah, just a map of Nevada. Access to capital, very important for an exploration stage company because uh, Gold Standard is spending tens of millions on uh, exploration. So they have two cornerstone shareholders which own a cumulative 29% of the stock. That's Oceana Gold and Gold Corp. There's an interesting story behind that because as you may remember, Gold Corp did not have any exposure to Nevada or the US in general. So they were using Gold Standard as their investment vehicle to see what could be done in the state of Nevada. And they were just continuing to sit on their position and they participated in every single capital raise. Same thing is valid for Oceana Gold. So if a company needs to raise $20 million, for instance, well, 30% is taken care of by those two companies who just want to maintain their position. So it makes uh, life a lot easier. And on top of that, gold standard is very liked, very much liked by the brokerage houses, which uh, also play an important role in effectively securing financing. Then the merits are pretty clear. They are um, exploring in the Carlin trend of Nevada, which is one of the most prolific uh, exploration districts in the world. The uh, deposits that you usually find in that region are usually pretty large, so uh, it's, uh, it's good to hunt for elephants rather than for uh, little mice. Um, they are solely focusing on the oxide layers right now, which is a low-hanging fruit. It's also the easiest to process and the easiest to, uh, to fund because the capital requirements to process oxide ore are so much lower than uh, sulfide ore. But it does mean that the potential for sulfides, which is higher grade and could be really large, remains underneath and at death. So it's pretty much included in the current market capitalization, which is a few hundred million dollars. So it's, uh, the market is already taking into account that beneath the uh, rich oxide layers, you may have a larger sulfide deposit that uh, could be very profitable because that's the sulfide deposits in Nevada are the, pretty much the only thing very gold is making money on these days. Second company, so we've had uh, a late stage exploration company. This is a development stage uh, company in Mexico. So the CEO is a former CEO of Castle Gold, which was sold to Argonaut Gold in, uh, I think it was 2012 or 13. But what's really important is that Darren Koningen, CEO, has put four or five mines into production in Mexico. He knows Mexico, he knows Mexican mining, he knows how to build a mine. That's the kind of team I would like to put my money in. Additionally, the director, Chester Miller, is the, uh, the inventor of heap leach processing of gold. So perhaps, small world of a uh, small world uh, word of explanation on that so you have generally you have two types of rock you've got oxides which is more like weathered rock on uh, close to the surface and you've got sulfides which has not been touched by uh, by oxygen on the uh, on the surface for oxide it is possible to process it through a heap leach method which basically is you just excavate the rock you throw it onto a pile you sinkle well you tinkle some uh, cyanide and other acids on it you recover everything at the, at the bottom and you filter the gold out. 
very easy, very straightforward, has been proven and been used for several decades, and it's by far the cheapest way to build a mine and to process the rock. Um, Chester Miller invented that process in the, I would say, the late 60s, early 70s. The guy is 92 years old, so uh, he, he has been around a few uh, oxide mines as well. Location, well, we sometimes hear all these bad stories about Mexico and Mexican cartels, and okay, sure. Um, there are some regions in Mexico you would not want to operate a mine in, but the projects of Minera Alamos, which is on the next slide, are still in quite safe jurisdictions. So you've got Sonora, which is bordering Arizona on the northeast corner, and uh, goes all the way to California on the north. That's still totally fine. Um, they're also operating in Sinaloa, which you may remember from the Sinaloa cartel, but that's not too bad because you so uh, it keeps everyone happy, so to speak. Permitting in Mexico is quite straightforward as well because the country still mainly depends on mining to boost their GDP, to create labor and create tax revenue. Minero Alamos had an issue. The second project they were trying to permit was actually permitted before the first one. Uh, the reason for that is pretty simple. As you may know, the uh, Mexicans had an election in late last year, and the first permit got caught up in the administration, just like in the transition period. So the first one should be issued in the next few, I would say in the next few weeks, but let's say around, uh, well, sometime in the next quarter should be issued as well. Access to capital, well, they just raised $5 million in equity in a no warrant deal, that's important. In Canada, usually private placements contain one share and either half of a warrant, which is some sort of call option and is added as a sweetener to uh, a private placement just to make sure it sells. Minera Alamos was able to do that without the sweetener. That's a very good sign of strength, especially when you know that they were, that they were able to raise the capital in just a few weeks' time. Secondly, very important, they have Cisco Gold Royalties as their main shareholder. Osisco is one of the largest streaming companies in the world. Uh, they're smaller than the silver, wheat, and wheat and precious metals, and the Franco Nevada, but they're smarter. Three or four years ago, they realized that they were no longer willing to compete with the existing streaming companies to overpay for a royalty or a streaming deal, so they went down the food chain. Rather than buying streams or royalties on existing projects or development stage projects, they went down, started this incubator model where they were, where they were taking equity stakes in junior exploration companies attached to a right of first refusal to be in the pole position to effectively buy a royalty or a streaming agreement uh, from said company. So that strategic relationship is very important because after this capital raise and perhaps a small loan to fund the working capital, well, Cisco Gold Royalties should very likely the, uh, well, will be the main financing company who uh, will provide the remainder of the capital expenditures. Merits, well, it's a small company. They uh, only work with smaller mines as well, so do not expect a huge 200,000 ounces per year producing mine. They've just assembled a portfolio, uh, excuse me, a portfolio of about um, three or four mines with a uh, output of 30, 40,000 ounces per year. So small is good because it's cheaper to develop and you uh, can fine tune things much faster rather than uh, spending first half a billion dollars on a mining operation only to see that uh, it's got some teething problems and you need to Throw in an additional $200 million at it. Uh, cash flow, well, the, as soon as the first permit, well, the permit for the first project comes in in the next uh, few weeks or months, uh, I anticipate that this company will only need 10 to 12 months to be in production. So this company should be in production on the first asset by, let's say, just say, the summer of next year, and the cash flow from that asset will be used to fund the second asset. So once you have initial cash flow, you just use the cash flow to just continue to, uh, to build out your, uh, your own company. And then for uh, some more conservative people in the room, uh, I also wanted to put in a senior producer because it reduces the risk, which also means we should not stick around for the three boxes because those companies have usually already proven themselves. But there's another important thing I would like to uh, discuss with you. When you invest in a blue chip, you look at the net profit. You look at price earnings. You look at how much money is a company making on the income statement. For a mining company, that's actually fundamentally a wrong thing to do. Mining operations are capital intensive, but they're only capital intensive at the beginning stage. You spend a billion dollars to build a mine, but the moment it's built, your expenses drop to just the sustaining capital expenditures. 
But on the income statement, you will still have to depreciate the asset. So let's say you, de you uh, depreciate $1 billion over 10 years. That's $100 million a year that you depreciate the asset. Let's say you're incurring an income and cash flow of $150 million a year. You will only see $50 million pop up on the income statement because you have your $100 million in depreciation. That's why you should look at the cash flow statement of mining companies. How much money, how much cash, how many dollars is a company really generating? That's the uh, cash flow statement for uh, Agnico Eagle for the uh, full year 2018. As you see in the bottom line, where it's highlighted in yellow, they uh, reported a $606 million uh, operating cash flow. I've adjusted that number for a change in the working capital because, uh, well, let's say you produce 30,000 ounces in December, in the final week of December, and you only ship them in January. Technically, you cannot record or report that as revenue. So that's why it's added as, a, as an inter inventory buildup. If you go to the investment cash flows, you see Agnico Eagle spend $1.09 billion in capital expenditures. So we made $646 million, they spend $1.09 billion. Result, negative cash flow of $440 million. Do you need to run for the hills? Is Agnico going down? No. You've got two different types of capex. First, you have the initial capex, which is how much it really costs to build a new mine. And then you have the sustaining capex, which you could probably best explain as how much money do you need to keep a mine up and running. Agnico has been spending, um, I would say, approximately $800 million last year on growth capex. They're building two new mines, and the money has to come from somewhere. But it would be fundamentally wrong to include that in your, uh, in your main calculations. So you should only look at the sustaining capital expenditures. So sustaining capex was 258 million. If you deduct that from the 646 million generated in operating cash flow, Agnico actually had a sustaining free cash flow of almost 400 million dollars. That's a fundamental difference that does not get shown on the income statement either. And of course, the um, 800 million dollars it's been spending will uh, be creative in the next few years as it will add uh, 650,000 ounces and an all-in cost of $750 per ounce. So that's $300 million in additional revenue, initial margins, sorry, that uh, Agnico will uh, start to generate us from 2020 and 2021 on. And then perhaps a, someone for, uh, well, a company for people who are um, more, well, less risk averse and more speculative. That's uh, Aben Resources, which is a pure exploration company. So they don't even have a resource yet. They're just just getting out of the gate to, uh, to explore uh, uh, their land package. Management checks the boxes. You have a CEO who sold his previous company for a few, uh, uh, I think it was almost $100 million to uh, New Gold. The chairman is Ron Nitalitsky, who has been uh, instrumental in discovering some high-grade gold mines in Canada. So these two guys should really know uh, what they're doing. Location, uh, British Columbia, sorry the uh, map isn't very clear, but that's British Columbia, the Golden Triangle in British Columbia, it's, it's Canada, it's BC, there's mining all over the place, it's as safe as it gets, so no one's, come, no one's gonna come in and uh, steal the project away from you. The only issue is that you have to deal with seasonality. Because the Golden Triangle is located so far in the north, your exploration season is limited to just four, five months a year. So companies always go in in, let's say, late April and have to pull back out like in mid and September just to, uh, because the weather is getting way too bad. Access to capital, that's very important. So even though it's an early stage exploration company, there are very few bankers and brokerage houses that are willing to touch that unless they're very, well, they have some speculative clients. So that's why it's interesting and important to see that people like Eric Sprott are stepping up and have invested $2 million in this company. It doesn't mean much. Eric Sprott is a multi-billionaire. He's got $2 billion in net assets. So for him, putting $2 million in a company is a 0.1% of his net asset. It doesn't mean much, but it allows companies like this to continue to work and to, con and to continue to work towards, say, uh, towards proving up an existing, uh, existing resource. But of course, if they fail to find more gold, then the access to capital markets outside of the Messinas like Eric Sprott will, uh, will probably fall. And uh, that, so it's really important for well, to realize that with this type of companies, it's either boom or bust. And then the merits, well, last year they did confirm the gold mineralization. They did find high-grade gold, which is one of the reasons why they were able to raise more money and that they still have $5 million in cash in the bank. So they should be fully funded for this exploration season. So it's really important for them now to try to repeat the, uh, the exploration success of last year. 
those were the four gold companies, all in different stages of uh, the development curve. So let's move over to uh, some of the silver companies. The first one I would like to mention here is uh, Golden Arrow Resources, which actually is in production as of uh, December last year. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and have a look at management first. So Grosso Group is headed by Joe Grosso. He's an older gentleman by now. He's 70, 75 years old. But 25, 30 years ago, he went down to Argentina. And he went down to Chile. And he saw all those large copper, gold, porphyries, and big mines on the Chilean side of the Andes. And he was wondering, well, if it exists on that side of the Andes, why is there no activity whatsoever on the east side of the Andes in Argentina? So he went into Argentina, started to stake claims, stake grounds. Uh, a lot of things didn't work out, obviously. But he found some really interesting projects that he was able to sell to other companies and monetize. On top of that, the company has some very knowledgeable technical people, like geologists and engineers, who really know what they're doing. Also have decades of experience in Argentina right now. So it's, uh, they've got a good team together that really understands and knows how to deal with and to work in Argentina. The main project that they just started production on is called Chinchillas. It was a grassroots exploration property. So there was nothing to see, just some moose pasture. The geologists went in, took samples, started to drill, and effectively did hit an ore body. Doesn't happen very often that, they were, that, they, uh, that you're immediately able to hit something, but they did it. Luck is an important factor, but what I really admire the company for is that they were able to advance the asset so rapidly. Location, it's... A dream, basically. Okay, it's in the middle of nowhere in Argentina, but it's located just 50 kilometers from where Silver Standard Mining, now called SSR Mining, had its Perquitas mine, which was running out of ore. So it's, uh, it's a blessing in a disguise because SSR was looking for mill feed just to keep the mill going, because if you need to shut the mill down, you are liable for all the environmental stuff that you need to clean up and complete your reclamation, which would have cost them between 50 and, uh, and about 100 million dollars. So they're desperately looking for more ore. And that allowed Golden Arrow to um, enter into a joint venture agreement with SSR Mining, whereby SSR would take 75% of the Golden Arrow property, but in return would contribute all their own Argentinian assets into a joint venture company. So, okay, you could look at that as if Golden Arrow has given up 75% of the property, which seems like a bad deal. But keep in mind, this was 2015, 2016. There was no money available. So for Golden Arrow to have built it themselves, it would have been absolutely a mission impossible. <coughs> Sorry, a mission impossible. So it's a, it's a deal with the devil in some ways, but allow them to go into production without too much dilution. So the company still has just over 100 million shares out, which is relatively low for an advanced stage uh, company. Access to capital, well, they just raised an additional $5 million just to make sure that they should be able to fund all the cash calls. So uh, although SSR is carrying the company to full production, there are always some uh, working capital needs. So uh, uh, the additional, uh, I think it was $4.7 million, but after paying all the bankers and all the lawyers, it's about $4 million net to the treasury. So uh, that should help them to weather any storms that, uh, that could arise over the next few uh, weeks and months. Additionally, since the project is in a commercial production since December, the operating subsidiary will start to generate free cash flow. The 25% stake attributable to uh, Golden Arrow will generate 1.6 million ounces of silver per year, and an all-in sustaining cost of $10 per ounce. So even at the current silver price of $15 per ounce, it should be profitable. It doesn't mean you will see this show up on the uh, income statement or even the cash flow statement of Golden Arrow. Because it's a 25% owned subsidiary, the, well, they have to <laughs> obey the accounting rules, which means that they have to book it as some sort of equity accounted investee rather than getting the 25% on their balance sheet and on their, uh, on their uh, income statement. An additional bonus are the polymetallics. So it's not just a pure silver deposit. There are also zinc and lead credits. And as zinc is going through the roof again with a price of $1.3 per pound, it generates a nice byproduct revenue. It's, it's, well, it won't move the needle, but it makes it more comfortable for any producer to, uh, to generate additional revenue and to increase the net margins. And finally, there's a spin-off potential as well, because this company has been able to take advantage of the uh, crisis on the commodity sector to acquire larger, perhaps lower-grade companies, but very interesting, um, on, the, uh, on the down low. So uh, they were able to acquire uh, the Indiana project, which has an existing resource of 3 million tons at 3 grams per ton gold and 1.6% copper, which is actually high-grade. 
And additionally, they were able to secure uh, the uh, Atlantida asset, which has in excess of 400 million tons in a copper gold porphyry. Not viable at the current prices, but there's the, uh, the potential to find a higher grade zone within the 400 million tons. Plus, it's a call option on both the gold price and the, uh, and the copper price. The next one I cheated on. I present it as a silver company because it has in excess of 100 million ounces of silver. But right now, at the current silver gold ratio and the prices of the precious metals, it mainly is a gold company right now. But the silver kicker is way too good to ignore here. So management, it's the same theme as Integra Gold, which was able to sell its previous company for almost $600 million to Eldorado Gold. And it started out just the same. Find an exploration project. Uh, started at the rock bottom and then just try to build it out until someone comes in and swoops the asset because it's too good to ignore. They've got an excellent team of geologists and engineers, so uh, they've got all bases covered and they've got plenty of experience under their belt from the Integra Gold story, which uh, ran for four or five years and went all the way from, uh, I would say, 15 cents to $1.15 when it was bought out by uh, Eldorado Gold two years ago. What's also interesting is the insider bias. That's usually a good measure to see how much a management really believes in its own company. If you see how three directors, uh, the CFO and the CEO, spend $200,000 of their own money on buying more stock of your own company on the open market, I see that as a good sign. Location, well, it's a past producing mine in Idaho. Um, because it's past producing, it should really simplify the permitting process. It's so much easier to disturb land that has already been disturbed rather than going into a nature reserve and trying to build a mine there. So Idaho, it's, the country is open to mining as long as it happens in a responsible and environmentally friendly way. So there's no ban on mining in Idaho. It's just perhaps a little bit tougher to get it permitted. So that's why it's good that it's a past producing mine as well. Otherwise, it would it'll probably take you a few years to, uh, to get everything done. So uh, just Idaho. Access to capital, well, another one of those companies that was able to, uh, to secure funding and a no warrant deal. They were able to raise $40 million over the past 18 months in no warrant financings. That's important because your warrant could keep a lid on the stock and avoid it from going higher because people just start to sell the stock and exercise the warrants the moment they become, well, they come in the money. So having no warrants really simplifies the share structure and keeps everything uh, clean and tight. And then the merits, well, past producing gold, it was shut down by Kindred's Gold because they were too lazy to explore the property. They just uh, picked the low hanging fruit, left and took off. Fresh look at things, it's been 15, 20 years since Kindred's produced there. So uh, there have been new exploration theories, there have been new exploration ideas. So when you bring an entirely new technical team that knows what it's doing, that has proven that it knows how to explore uh, for gold and silver, then it usually, well, usually some new things pop up. The current resource estimate contains about 2.3 million ounces of gold and 100 million, uh, 108 million ounces of silver, and there's more to come. Why do I say there's more to come? Let's see if the laser works. Okay. So the existing resource of 2.3 million ounces of gold and 100 million ounces of silver ends here. If you see this drill interval, it's about three to 400 meters away and the company found in excess of 100 meters at more than two grams per ton. That's more than three times the average resource grade, and it's located 300 meters outside of that resource. So perhaps not the next resource, because they need to do some more infill drilling to connect all the dots, but let's say in 2020, I would dare to go on the record and say that this company will have in excess of five million ounces of gold equivalent in, uh, as well throughout the, uh, the entire resource estimate. So it's just, it's, the stupidity of Kindred's gold is sometimes unbelievable. They, uh, instead of spending five or ten million dollars on exploration and really figuring things out before they leave everything and sell it for a song to the next company, they really neglected to do some thorough exploration. That's, uh, that's something that big companies are really, um, well, guilty for. It's, uh, they, they just pick the low-hanging fruit and they leave. It's, uh, it's a pity, but it's an opportunity for pretty much any other company that has a, uh, a better understanding of exploration and uh, applies their own exploration theories. Most people will know Hecla Mining. It has been a uh, silver, well, preferred silver company for the past, I would say, 10, 15 years. It's also one of the very few premier silver companies because you've got a lot of silver miners where they mine silver as a byproduct. But Hecla started out as a pure silver mine with some zinc and lead as, uh, as byproducts. The thing is, 
We haven't heard a peep from Ecla in the past three or four years. The company doesn't do any promotion, doesn't do any marketing, but sometimes less is more. It does keep a tight grip on finances, so they just keep their head down, continue to work on the assets, continue to try to improve the financial and the uh, operating performance. So management knows what it's doing. There's only one issue that needs to be resolved, and that's the strike at the uh, Lucky Friday mine in Idaho, which will be the seventh mine that goes into production uh, for Hecla. So there has been a strike since the summer of 2017, because the unions uh, demand higher wages, obviously. Um, but Hecla doesn't seem to be in a rush to solve this issue, and I can understand them. Why would you solve a labor issue if it would force you to restart production and sell the silver at $15 per ounce, if you could rather just keep it in the ground until the, uh, the times improve and you can actually also afford to pay a higher wage to the, uh, to the laborers. Location, well, all producing mines are uh, in North America. So uh, we've got one Canadian mine. Everything else except for San Sebastian in uh, Mexico is based in the United States. So uh, that's the tier one destination that most other companies are looking for. So uh, they are willing to pay a premium price for assets in those regions. Plus, by focusing on the entire western edge of the United States, Hecla knows what it's doing. So if you go back to the previous slide, there were two recent acquisitions that were specifically focusing on those safe assets in the United States. They acquired the Rock Creek Mine and the Montenor Mine in Montana. If you look at the resources of those two uh, projects combined, there are 300 million ounces of silver and about 3 billion pounds of copper in the ground. Hecla was able to acquire those resources for 50 million US dollars, almost for nothing. Sure, it takes a lot of money to continue to work on it, and permitting in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Montana is not always easy, and it will take two to five years, but they've got time. Silver is trading at $15 an ounce, why would you waste and rush and try to put silver out and sell that at $15 an ounce. Just, they can take their time, they just advance the properties, make sure they get permitted on time, and then just wait until the uh, silver market improves. But the fact that they were able to secure these types of assets in underground mines in Montana, tier one jurisdiction, for just a fraction of uh, what will be the net present value, I think that really speaks to the, uh, to the quality of the management there. Well, the merits are pretty clear, high-grade production, so even at $15 per ounce, they uh, are profitable. Well, I would say cash flow positive, otherwise I just contradict myself. They're cash flow positive, and what's interesting is that they do not, or usually don't spend more than they are earning. So it's not like they're borrowing money just to advance projects for the sake of advancing it. They just put the budget based on how much they expect to generate at, for instance, $16 silver or $15 silver, and then stick to that budget. So everything gets timed really well, just to make sure that they do not run into any issues. And of course, the balance sheet is still quite clean because of that. So even if they would need to, uh, to raise debt, perhaps to finance the uh, construction of uh, either Mountain or, or uh, Rock Creek, or perhaps the reopening of the, uh, of the Lucky Friday mine, they should be able to, uh, to raise it in debt rather than issuing new shares to, uh, uh, to, reopen, well, to open those mines or to reopen uh, Lucky Friday. Mining is more than just precious metals. So we've got four gold companies now, three silver companies. So Brecht wanted me to put two or three miscellaneous companies that do not fit into the uh, precious metal box uh, up front. First one is Excelsior Mining. I've been to the Excelsior Mining site, I would say, three or four years ago. There was nothing there. I loved it. There was absolutely nothing. You had a highway, you had a power line. But apart from that, nothing. No ancient burial grounds, no cows grazing, no little villages of people you would disturb. There was nothing. Perfect spot for a mine site. Management. Well, CEO Twyrold has been with the company for, I would say, about 10 years now. So he's seen the company through every single phase of what a mining company goes through. You explore the asset, you put a resource together, you try to uh, put a feasibility study together. Once you've got that, you permit it, you find financing, and then you go into production. That's an uh, eight to 10 year, um, oh, oh, there we go. That's usually an eight to 10 year process. So uh, he's stuck with the company throughout the entire 10 years, and that's something you very rarely see in, uh, in this sector. It's also important that even though he's Australian, he actually lives in Arizona. That's quite a commitment. It's nice in the, in the winter period, but it's unbearable in the summer period. So it's good to see that uh, he's so committed to his company and his project that he actually lives in Arizona. Location, well, Arizona is very mining friendly. Uh, you could 
well, probably see that because the project got, uh, got permitted as well. But what very few people know is that Arizona takes care of about 75% of the domestic copper production in the United States. Every single major copper company, except for Antofagasta, I believe, is, well, has operations in Arizona. When you fly, when you take a flight from, let's say, Phoenix to Hermosillo in Mexico, you just see one large open pit copper gold mine after one another. So it's really, well, copper mining in Arizona really uh, takes care of an important part of GDP, provides a lot of tax revenue. So that's why Arizona should definitely be seen as some sort of very uh, mining friendly region. And as I said, perfect access. You had a highway running right through uh, the property. You had a railway which connects uh, the property pretty much all the way to the port of Los Angeles and San Francisco to ship out the, uh, the, uh, the copper product. So the infrastructure was a, was a dream. And like I said, there's almost no local population, so you are not disturbing anyone. You can pretty much do whatever and there is no one to, uh, to stop you. Access to capital. Well, Excelsior has been lucky. Three, four years ago, no one cared about copper. Copper was trading at 240, 225, maybe 250. No one cared about copper because there was an abundance. One London-based fund stepped up the plate, looked at the project, had a six to eight month due diligence process, and eventually decided to become the company's largest shareholder. They have been participating in every single capital raise since uh, they, uh, they invested in the company. So they, uh, they will continue to backstop any potential future financing to, uh, to secure funding for the second phase and third phase of the, uh, of the mine plan. So right now, the, project, well, the company is permitted for uh, an initial phase one production, which should be about 25 million pounds of copper. So it's more some sort of proof of concept. Because they are trying to recover the copper through the in-situ recovery method, where you just pump solution into the ground and then back up uh, through other wellheads, there's usually a big difference between theory and real world. So the next 12 to 18 months will be important to see if Excelsior Mining is indeed able to live up to the anticipated recovery rates as uh, as outlined in the feasibility study. And once that has been proven, and probably the financiers wouldn't even need to see the final details of that, they can immediately scale up the production from 25 million pounds per year to 75 million pounds per year to 125 million pounds per year. Why is that interesting? Because the higher your production uh, increases, the more synergies and economies of scale you create, which keeps the all-in sustaining cost per produced pound of copper to less than $1.5 per pound. So even if you're not a believer in the copper space, even if you think that the copper price will decrease from $2.9 per pound right now to let's say $2 per pound, they will still have a positive operating margin on an all-in sustaining basis. Doesn't mean the share price will do well, but it means that they will survive where other companies with a higher production cost will uh, go down in flames. So using $275 copper, the after-tax net present value is about 1.1 billion Canadian dollars which is about four times the current market capitalization. So as you see, the market is still waiting to see the final recovery rate results to see if the real world experience effectively matches up to the feasibility study and the theory of the, uh, of the project. So once that has been proven, uh, you could assume that that gap should close relatively fast or someone else will come after them. And then finally, it's, um, it's not a mining company. Oh. Test, test. Ah, there we go. It's not a mining company, but it's more like an investment holding. Um, it is being run by a Belgian guy named Guido Klutens. He has about three decades of experience in uh, banking, investment banking and investment. Another member of the team is a director, Martin Burian. He used to be managing director of uh, investment banking at Haywood Securities. So you've got two people who understand capital markets, who understand how to invest, who understand how to deal with uh, public markets. The company invests in public and private securities, so that gives investors in LSA a leg up because the, well, you get indirect access to securities that are usually not tradable by uh, mortals like us. So it, it really helps you to diversify your holdings because the, uh, the company diversifies it really for you. The main target of the company, uh, as most investment holdings, is just to increase the net asset value per share. Plus, the company is also paying a dividend. So uh, I believe LSA is paying three cents per year in dividends. And as the share price is about 36 cents per year, it works out to be around 8% uh, as a dividend yield. And it's important to note that unlike other companies or other uh, investment holdings, they do not take money from the asset base just to afford a dividend. So as we can see, 
right here, the track record speaks for itself. So in the past five years, the company was able to increase the net asset value from 26 to 52 cents. So in five years, it doubled the net asset value while it actually paid 12 cents in dividends. If you would add that together, the cumulative performance makes uh, Elise uh, one, of the, well, one of the better investments, indirect investments into the mining sector because they went up from 26 cents to 64 cents, which is an average annual return of almost 20%. Well, that's a pretty decent annual return. It doesn't obviously mean that they will, able, will, that they will be able to repeat that in the future, but it's also important to know that the CEO owns about 20% of the stock, which he has bought on the open market. So I think it helps to alleviate any concerns that uh, the investment thesis and the investment plans and the business plan is pretty sound because if he would run the company to the ground, he's just uh, cutting into his own flesh and shooting himself in his own foot. And that's it for me. Um, I believe Brecht wanted to make sure there was plenty of time for questions, so I'm fully prepared for that. Oh. Sorry, I started talking in Dutch. <laughs> Is there a special broker you uh, can have several? Can I, yeah, I mainly use Canadian brokers for the Canadian market because they are able to deal with the paperwork because in Canada, for instance, when you participate in a private placement, you still get a paper certificate, which is a real pain in the butt to try to convert in Belgium or in the Netherlands. So that's why I use some Canadian brokerage firms. Plus, it also helps to diversify outside of the EU banking system, which is one of the topics we've uh, covered at the, earlier today. So. Uh, in Canada, I would just stick with the larger names, like a Canaccord Genuity, like a Haywood uh, Securities. So pretty much everyone there knows what it's doing. The only downside is that the transaction fees are higher than, for instance, the discount brokers in the, uh, in the Benelux. Plus, um, the, uh, the options are quite limited. So you can trade in Canada, the US, and Australia, but you probably wouldn't be able to trade on the German exchange or, uh, or Amsterdam. So there's upside and downside, but it, it really helps to reduce the paperwork and to uh, make your life easier if you have some uh, Canadian brokerage houses as well. Thank you. Over there. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, what do you think about the Companies that dive up the gold from the bottom of the sea. <coughs> They've been around for 10 years. It's a nice theory. It sounds really nice. It sounds like a Hollywood movie. But until I see actual results, I wouldn't hold my breath. There's a big one. Nautilus? Nautilus? Yeah. They've been trying it for 10, 15 years. They actually already went bankrupt four or five years ago, then restarted again, but it's a nice theory, but not a fan. Thank you. Clear answer. <laughs> <laughs> More. You have been very clear. Apparently. Ah. Okay. So it shows it. Okay. Uh. Uh, there are several indexes. Uh, in the beginning you started, there are a lot of mining companies uh, you shouldn't uh, buy. Mm -hmm. Are there in the, in the indexes? Um, no. It's, uh, I was mainly referring to really small companies that have no real activities. So there are plenty of those, like the Venture Exchange has about two or 3,000 companies. So the really bad ones that have no reason to exist usually do not end up in one of the, uh, uh, the Venture 50 or Venture 200 index. So you're okay with that, but just always have a good look at the annual information form and see what companies are spending their money at. Because in Canada, the regulator requires them in their financial statements to clearly disclose how much they're spending on what category. So how much has been spent on exploration, how much has been spent on development, how much has been spent on GNA, salaries, professional fees. So if you see a ratio of 60 to 70% of any dollar that has been expensed, 
If 60 or 70 percent goes into the ground, that's fantastic. If 10, 20, 25 percent goes into the ground and 75 percent is meant to, uh, to fund the overhead expenses, run. Okay, clear answer. Um, I have a question actually, Thibault. Uh, um, you mentioned um, El Rao Gold mm -hmm. in your yep. presentation. Um, are you? What is your opinion? Are they de developing in the right direction, or is this a lost case? A year ago, I would have said it's a lost case. Right now, they seem to have bottomed out. Their main issue is that they need to get the mines in Greece going. They're the real money makers. Scuris. Yeah, Scurius and uh, the other one next door. The thing is, you will only be able to get those going if you strike a deal with the Greek government. Cut them in. It's better to have 75% of the asset and give 25% to the Greek government and build it, rather than just sitting on it and not being able to move forward. So uh, El Dorado Gold, they had good intentions. They sold the Chinese portfolio two or three years ago to cash up. Good. They bought Integra Gold at a premium to the net asset value, which was not the smartest move. But they continue to find more and higher grade gold uh, below the existing resource. So it could turn out well. But they really need to get the Greek property going. Mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah. what's going to drive the share price, I think. OK, thank you. Another question over there? I know, uh, <coughs> sorry, from uh, your point of, point of view, uh, the location of the mine is wrong, but uh, what do you think of Ivanhoe mining? From a technical perspective, it's a dream. It's a great deposit. It's, uh, it's very mineable. It's very high grade. Ivanhoe has the right people to push it forward. But as you said, project location. It used to be a buy when it was trading below net cash three or four years ago. But now you really need to wonder if you're investing in that company that has the assets in South Africa and the DRC, if you would be if you would be sleeping well at night. It should be fine for like a small, high risky and speculative part of your portfolio, but do not bet the farm on it. So from a technical perspective, it's a great project. Like Camo, I think you're specifically referring to Camo and the uh, and the DRC. Great project, but the location you never know. But on the other hand. Because Ivanhoe is so big, they should be able to deal with the Congolese government on a different level rather than smaller companies. They could even strike a deal with the Chinese to make sure that no one at the uh, DRC political level uh, tries to intervene because the Chinese have a vested interest in Ivanhoe succeeding as well. So it's not exactly black-white, but a lot of those negotiations will happen in small little back rooms that we will not uh, have access to. So they have a chance, but yeah, it's not the safest one. More questions? Your favorite mine, it's the time to check. <laughs> <laughs> check your mind. Check your mind. <laughs> Good. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank Fibo for his uh, expertise. <laughs> and with that,